Welcome back, everyone, once again to the SitRep Podcast, your source for historical military wargaming. I am your host, as always, Ariskany Jim, and today I am joined by a blast from the past, my friend Alex from back in the day. Alex, how are you? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. So, what we're looking at today is the Battle of Mogadishu, or to expand on that a little bit, pretty much the situation in Somalia in general, 1992 and 93. I mean, everyone's seen the movie Black Hawk Down. We are not going to do the entirety of Black Hawk Down. We're not going to do the actual assault on the Olympic Hotel or anything like that. This is going to be a nice little small one, guys. So I won't, you know, belabor the whole background of the whole situation here. Mogadishu, city in Somalia, uh, back in 1993, it was definitely, you know, not the best neighborhood in the world. And you would have various places in the city where American or United Nations or some sort of coalitional forces would be forward deployed. We had, you know, the headquarters here, Task Force Ranger at Mogadishu Airport. There was also the soccer stadium, as we see in the movie, there was a pretty major UN presence there. There are small safe zones, small fire bases, small staging points around the city where troops are sort of at least trying to keep the warlords in check. Part of that shutdown effort was to go out when they got decent intelligence, or they thought they had decent intelligence, go out into the city, either in road convoys or with helicopter insertions, and grab some of these warlords or some of their top lieutenants. Those didn't always go very well. Again, the raid that we see in Black Hawk Down was by no means the only such operation. It's the one that everyone knows about. It's probably the biggest one and certainly the most infamous. But this kind of stuff was happening on a fairly regular basis. This is more of like a day in the life uh, sort of a scenario sometime in Somalia in 1993. So here is our map. This is the equivalent of three Valorant victory maps. Uh, 12 hexes high by six hexes across times three, so 18 hexes across. And what we're looking at here is very quickly a crash site so a black hawk has gone down there is a half squad in there that represents part of the crew and another part of the crew is represented by a casualty marker a casualty marker in this particular scenario is not allowed to evacuate via the normal casualty evacuation rules in valorant victory modern expansion as presented in our expansion of barry doyle's valorant victory system He's basically an objective. The Americans have to get uh, an, an SAR bird, a search and rescue bird, to within two hexes, land the helicopter, and then fly this casualty out that way. Of course, you can't do that. You can't just fly in with any kind of helicopter. The streets are going to be swarming with Adid militia. And so a column of Rangers, basically in platoon strength, three Humvees and a uh, deuce and a half. They're loaded for barely they have all kinds of support weapons on top of the support weapons that they carry baked into their normal attack factors. Again, we do have the little bird um, that is unarmed. That particular little bird is unarmed. He's just a medical, notice he has no attack value so here. He is a medical helicopter. He's got a medic on board, or a two-man medic team on board. He's the one that might actually, you know, win the game objective-wise. However, there is an old-school MH6 little bird gunship. So, as the Somali player, I'll definitely be keeping a big eye out for him, because he's pretty dangerous. <laughs> We've seen the movie. He's got mini guns, he's got uh, all kinds of chain guns, machine guns. It's, that, that's a scary little, uh, scary little asset there. And of course, the Humvees have 50 cows on the roof, so that's, a, that's an issue. And uh, of course, the um, Rangers themselves are all elite and they're all loaded pretty badly for bear. Right now I've got them all in here as half squads, but of course, uh, if Alex chooses as the American player, he can combine them into full squads if he wants. The Americans will be moving first. They will be entering from any of these southern road hexes. There are some Somali roadblocks in place. We all know about the piles of burning tires. There are civilians on the table. The uh, rules of engagement do apply. Americans are not allowed to fire into or through uh, civilian hexes. So the uh, Adid player might be able to use them to their tactical advantage. We'll see how that works out. Neither side really controls the civilians. They move kind of randomly. And other than that, Alex, any uh, any questions or comments uh, from you about today's scenario? Um, no, I just, uh, I think I'm ready to go. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start this off on turn one. 
Best of luck to the American player, although again, I am playing uh, the Somali Adid Militia. It's going to be my job to get to that crash site and uh, capture that casualty. I want that guy duct taped to a chair in a basement, and I'm prepared to pay for it. So we'll see how it goes. All right, everybody, here we are midway through turn one. The Americans have completed their movement. A little bit more audacious than I was expecting, so well done there, Alex. Uh, so, Alex, you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you did your, your first movement phase? Yeah, um, I just tried to get my vehicles up as close to the crash site as possible and establish a little perimeter um, with respects to where the enemy might come in. I, I was trying to, it's been a while since I played this game, but I was at least trying to play the enemy you know, side in my head while I was trying to deploy my troops to try to figure out what I would do. And uh, with respect to that, so let's we'll see if I can hold the perimeter. And taking advantage of a couple little um, cubby holes here, or a couple little tunnels, through the Somali uh, roadblocks. Um, again, you can technically get through here. P6 is technically a clear hex, everyone, because that dot is not covered by the building graphic. So he can go around that roadblock and kind of kind of crash through. That's how uh, these trucks got into, or at least this truck got into position. He bailed out, then he used advanced the assault phase to move his people undercover. Now, as far as my move goes, I'm coming in from either the east, west, or south edges of the map. This is pretty much as the city goes into uproar. The only exception, uh, the Adid militia is not allowed to come in from the north because that would be cheesy. I would literally just assault the objective hex on turn one. Then. That was a fun game. So before we get into Somali entrance, what we're going to do is roll for civilian movement. Civilians are, again, not really controlled by either player. They move randomly, and here's where we do that at the beginning of each side's movement phase. So I'll start off with the civilians in J5. On a 4-up, they are moving. So he is moving. He moves in a random direction. He moves in direction 4. So straight south. 1, 2. Next civilian hex here in Sierra 8. Uh, he's not moving. And the civilians were you're stacked with and it looks like that is Tango 4. He is not moving. He's staying put where he is. All right, so that takes care of civilian movement, and now I'm gonna go ahead and start moving in with my actual guys. Okay, first stack coming in. I'm gonna lead off with my kind of bow cells here with my negative zero leader. My movement rate is six as long as I have a leader. One, two, three, four. Five. Uh, opportunity to fire. <laughs> and six. I'm going to take it at probably M5. From Hex Mike 3. Looks like Lieutenant Jacobson has a very clear shot on my boy, Mr. Perko, <laughs> and his little mob. All right, Mr. Jacobson, what are we doing? Um, at the combined 17, I think. And they, they got a minus two to their, their dice roll. They get a minus two to your dice roll, an additional minus one, because we're talking about opportunity fire, and I am in the open. It's a total of negative three on the 17 row. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to this. Uh, 2d6, a 12 would be appreciated. I rolled a six. He rolled a six. Uh, that becomes a three. That is, oh my god, six casualty points. Minus twos, yeah. Um, becomes a, oh, yeah, minus three. Yeah, minus three, because uh, opportunity fire, you, you get an additional negative one if you're in the open, which I am in the open. Oh, well, yeah, okay, wow. Yeah. Okay. I literally just ran down the street in front of nine people with M16s. Uh, there's going to be at least two M249s in there, and one guy's packing an M240. So I walked into a combined cyclic rate of fire of like seven trillion rounds a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of expecting this. That's why I led with the uh, platoon that has that negative zero leader, because the hell with that guy, man. All right, so that's a total of six casualty points. Uh, we're going to go ahead and knock that full squad down to a half squad. And then I still have to... Oof, I'll kill a, another half squad. That's four. And then I will pin down these two units. He's pinned. He's pinned. That's a total of six casualty points assessed rest of the uh, air quotes assault goes in, if you want to call it that. Next, we're going to go ahead with my next squad. Or my next little platoon, so to speak. One, two, three, 
four or five. All right, now Jacobson's already taken his opportunity fire, and Ramirez can't see him. The Maw Deuce on top of the Humvee can sort of see him. It depends on when you take the opportunity fire. I uh, can. Can I take it in K four? Yep, he's worth six points. So I'll just zoom this in just for a second. Um, it's got 360 degree fire arc. That's why it's in a white circle. It's six uh, anti personnel points. So. You do get negative one because I am. You are taking opportunity fire in the open. So we're talking about a total of six minus one. I rolled a six again. Um, one to affect the five. It goes down to that. Uh, his red has three casualty points. Knock him down, and I'm going to go ahead and pin down a half squad. Now both of these units have taken their uh, opportunity fire. Again, it's just numbers, man. We're coming in. One, two, three. Now, hold on, I'm not moving in that hex. I'm just gonna break this up. I can't move everything in there. I'm definitely gonna move in uh, this full squad. I'm gonna move in one more half squad. That stack is now maximum stacked. And then these two, they've moved three hexes so far. I don't wanna move into L1, because Ramirez can see L2. <laughs> no, thank you. I think Majub is just going to hang back for now. You know what? I'm going to keep him back here. <laughs> he said the rest of the guys forward to uh, assault the Rangers. Meanwhile, Majub himself is like, I've got your back, dude. I got your way back. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, I do have a technical that is going to roll in. I'm trying to get a scraping fire on him. I want to be able to shoot my technicals at your Humvee next turn. I don't want to be parking right out in the open when I do that. So I was hoping for scraping fire, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. All right, let's keep the stream going. I got two more little uh, squads over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, over the wall. Sorry, they're in a courtyard now. And six. Pretty sure I am still covered. Yeah. Vector 4 does block. All right, and that's it for my movement. That's also going to be it for opportunity fire. Defensive fire, I don't think you have any left. Defensive fire is anyone who can see a Somali unit that didn't take opportunity fire. Uh, technically, the guy up in the casualty hex with the helicopter. Oh, yeah, there is a, there is a squad in there. Or a half yeah. squad. He does have an M4. Cool. Good eyes. Yeah, and same with uh, the, there's a squad right across the street from him, and um, what's it, R2? He can actually shoot right over it. Yeah, he'll be shooting through some walls, but yeah, he does have a shot. Yeah. Okay, so six minus one. All right, six minus one. Um, oh, I'm sorry, add one, that's what I should say. Add one to your roll is what I meant to say. Ooh, uh, two. Oh, man, okay, so... Even though the wall was there, uh, Snake Eyes becomes a five. That is five casualty points. Yeah, he's toast. There's only two casualty points there. Splat. Okay, and then we'll roll to see if he can become Valorous. So you roll 2d6. You're trying to get under the casualty rating of the unit. Uh, we do give a bonus for elite units, so you never know. Try to roll a four or less on 2d6. Uh, I got a five. Oh, almost. All right, cool. And then uh, you were looking over here at Mr. Williams. I don't know if he, okay, he's, they got a range of five. He is barely has range for shooting at hex um, Mike five. He will, however, be shooting through two balls. So he's going to be adding two to his die roll. Subtract one for Williams' leadership bonus. Becomes a net plus one. Now he can shoot. The half squad can fire their rifles. Of course, Williams can fire his rifles. You cannot shoot the law. The law only has a range of three. All right. So it's only eight points. That's a five to ten table minus one. Technically, add one. All right. I am. Uh, I rolled a seven, so it becomes effectively. It becomes uh, an eight. He missed. All right. So then we're gonna go into the advance and assault phase. Yeah, we're gonna be doing some advance and assault. All right. Um, first of all, let me get the easy stuff out of the way. We're going to move up here and advance an assault. Advance an assault. Advance an... Actually, I'm going to stay back there. Nah. Advance 
advance an assault. And here we go with an assault. Alright, here is where it gets fun. And uh, by that I mean not really. Okay, I have a grand total of a lot. 9, 13, 17, 25, 29 versus... Yeah, it's 12 plus 5, 17. So that is still technically 1, one to, to one. 1. Oh my god. And Jacobson's in there. Oh god, Rangers for the win, man. I am throwing in 1, 2, 3, 4 grenades. Because I am I'm desperate, man. <laughs> Whoops. I'm multiplying my grenades. That's, that's cheap. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, so it's one grenade per infantry uh, unit in there. I have four infantry units in there. Leaders do count as infantry units. So I'm throwing in as many grenades as I possibly can. Okay, how about yourself? Are you throwing in any grenades? Three. I, it's the max I can throw, so that's what I'm going to do. All right. Oh, God. If I ever needed a lucky roll, it's now. Look at that. Hey, we're getting right to the thick of it here on the Sitrep Podcast. We're not messing around. Okay, so it is technically one to one. I can't believe that. Rangers are freaking badass, man. I get to subtract one from my die roll, for the leader, I should say. One, two, three, four. I get to subtract a total of five from my die roll. However, I have to add two to the die roll because of Jacobson. One, two, three for grenades. So subtract five, add five. We're down to a wash on the one to one table. The problem is, I think that favors you. Yeah, one-to-one -one table on the close assault uh, combat table is a six or less on two to six. Oh no! Here we go. Uh, somebody help me! Oh, I don't want to do this. Snake eyes. You just lost the initiative. That was rolled on camera. Oh. Okay, now that did cost me one, two, three, four, five for the building, a total of five cash points. Dead. Down to one, two, three, four. Five. These guys are all destroyed, and that is going to be uh, a total of three casualty points that I have now captured. The people who watch Valorant Victory or who play Valorant Victory, we usually count. Damn, uh, buildings as two, not three, um, like you see in normal Valorant Victory because buildings are damaged, buildings have been shot up, buildings are incomplete. I, obviously we're talking about like Somali slums here, there's not even rooms on some of the buildings. All these grains are used up. And that is the end of my advance on the assault phase. I'm going to try to rally this guy. Fail, because I'm not elite. Try to rally this guy. He cannot, well, he has a negative zero anyway. Uh, he fails as well. And he's in there with somebody, right? Yep. He succeeds, ironically. So, for now, I think that's going to go ahead and end the turn. <laughs> Anything to add to that, uh, Alex? Uh, the, those snake eyes just made my uh, heart drop out through my, you know. Yeah, that's the... But, yep, that's... I, I'm, it makes me really wish I had put somebody in L2. Um, oh, I did forget to rally um, the guys who were actually in that assault. So let me try that. Now, he does have a negative one leader, so he will rally on a seven or better. Uh, he does rally. All right, now, what I was going to say is if. Now, it's going to cause casualties, but if you assault back into M3, anytime free world forces or regular forces assault uh, militia hex and any casualties that you take via an assault become POWs, and then those POWs, if they have if successfully evacuated, they're, they're worth double victory points as well. So yeah, that's going to wrap things up for turn one. Uh, it's already it's kicked off in a big way. The Americans got that perimeter going a lot faster than I thought, and then my Somalis cracked that perimeter a lot faster than I thought. So yeah, we'll see what's happening uh, as the game progresses from here. All right, guys, we're at the beginning of turn two. Alex has looked over his command phase. I don't think he wants to do very much. And now we're going to go straight into his fire phase. Oh, Lord. All right, Alex, I await your displeasure. However you want to do this. All right, I'm going to start with Ramirez over here. Oh, um, no. Ramirez is already adjacent to El Roddy, so you can fire and assault in the uh, same turn. 
<laughs> okay. Maybe for some hurt, because um, I've got 17 points coming your way. Plus, I'm going to throw grenades. All right, cool. Yes, yeah, so you can use grenades uh, for people in the audience to add to your direct fire if you're adjacent, which he obviously is. He's going through grenades fast, folks. Okay, 17. You get to subtract three from your roll for your three grenades. Subtract a fourth from your roll because of Ramirez's leadership bonus. You do have to add two to your roll, however, because I am in a building. So we're literally in room-to-room -room combat now. So 17 net subtract two from the die roll. I roll a six, which becomes an effective four. Four on 17 is five more casualty points. I'm trying to keep that arm off. So I'll knock him down to half a squad. That's two. Oh, God. I'm, in case he wants to assault me, I'm going to pin down my officer. I hate pinning down leaders because that negative one is, is worth at least half a squad, if not a full squad, if you actually look at how the math works in the game. But at the same time, I, I'm afraid he's going to assault me, and if he does, I want to be able to put at least one RPG through the door. Okay, um, that's that fire phase. Other fire? Yes, so um, the southernmost Humvee right. is going to uh, shoot. You know what? Um, hold up. I'm going to actually fire with a ranger that's in in the casualty hex first. Okay, no worries. He's going to also fire into M3. Six points and three to 2d6 on the white row. I rolled a five, which becomes an eight, so no no good there. All right, so Mr. Crew Chief here um, can't find anybody this turn. All right, and then uh, whatever unit you want to shoot next. Okay, uh, my uh, Humvee, the southernmost Humvee, he's going to take a shot at your technical. The thing is, both of these technical, the Humvee and the technical, are carrying 50 cows, which anyone who's fired a 50 cal will tell you is a technically a light armor-piercing weapon. So you can use the anti-tank rules for this. So if you use your 50 cal as an anti-tank weapon, all you have to do is roll the hits. And then per the rules, both in my rules and in this more, much more importantly in, Val in Barry Doyle's rules, any soft-skinned vehicle hit by armor-piercing weapons is automatically destroyed. It's just whether or not you hit or not. It's an eight or less. Okay, eight or less, got yep. it. Uh, I, I rolled a seven on a All right, so that's a hit, and then that's a it's just no cover. I was trying to get into the cover there, but then I wouldn't be able to shoot it myself. Okay, he is smoked. Again, all these vehicles are unarmored, so word of the wise. My RPGs or my 50 cals hit your Humvees or your helicopters, which are also unarmored vehicles. We could be seeing, uh, we got another Black Hawk down somewhere, or technically a Little Bird. So, uh, what else are we going to shoot? Okay, um, over on my right wing. Um, okay. They're going to take a shot at the. Let me see which one has. What has what? They both have light, light machine guns, it looks like. Um, this guy has a PKM. This guy has a very light machine gun. I think it's an RPK. All right, I'm going to take a shot at Ebu with uh, yeah. Ericsson. All right, so Ericsson's got, uh, again, 17. Negative one for his leadership bonus. Not close enough for any grenades. Uh, plus two for buildings, so you have to add a net one to your roll. Six becomes a seven. Two casualty points. You know what? It's time for me to take a little easy on my cash. So I'm just kind of begging to this at this point. Next we go to your Humvee, who can see lots. You can see this Humvee, or I'm sorry, this technical, you can see these two squads. He has an embarrassment of choices to shoot him. Um, now this is a uh, quick question. Can yep. the Humvee shoot and then move? Only using advanced assault phase. Okay. We do have helicopters, so good question. We will have units that shoot move at the same time. Right, I, I'm wanting to see if he can shoot and then back up into S5. Technically, no, because in advance on assault, vehicles, I think, can only move forward. Okay. Alrighty. Um, I think I'm going to hold off on him. Okay, so we're going to save him for movement. This Humvee, unless he has movement, can get a scraping shot and hit Mike 3 if he wants. He's, I've got special plan for him. No worries. All right, that's going to wrap up the fire phase. Movement phase on American turn two. And here's where it gets pretty serious because the Americans have brought in their little bird. So, Alex, where did you bring in your, your helicopter out here? Talk to me about uh, why you came in the way you did. 
Okay, so I came up through the end column and I basically flew up that road going to the right and uh, cut through that little alley that I took my uh, Humvees up through and plopped myself down into Q6. I was trying to keep out of the line of sight of his entire right wing, uh, which I seem to have succeeded. And my plan is to, to hover there and drop a lot of lead into M3 so that way maybe I don't have to waste time with an assault. All right, so the initial approach was pretty good. My Ducey can shoot him out of the sky. I've got a Soviet 12.7 millimeter heavy machine gun on the back of that remaining truck. He blew up my other one, so that's good. He took out one of my RPGs. There is one RPG left. So ground fire is a thing, but I honestly don't have enough forces left to knock him down with small arms fire. You need a lot of small arms fire to bring out a helicopter, like an absurd amount. And I'd much rather be shooting at Rangers, to be perfectly honest. However, I do have, again, RPGs and uh, Dushkas. So the first Dushka here, I'm tracking the Dushka had a range of 10, but as you, again, there's the firing unit. As he flies up the street, there's something always in the way. As he moves from hex to hex, he is basically flying down the street, setting off car alarms as he goes. And uh, he flies right over top of that uh, burning pile of tires there and curls the smoke in his rotors. He winds up there in Q6. I'm assuming you want, you're going to be you end up with a facing northwest to uh, engage Mike 3? Yep. Cool. So, yeah, facing does matter for helicopters because depending on their weapons, they can either be fixed forward firing arcs or basically flying assault guns, which in this case definitely applies. These are machine guns and small rocket pods mounted to the actual wings or the struts of the, uh, of the helicopter. The only issue is that there is one RPG left, and I am in range. So I do get opportunity fire with him. I'm going to go ahead and cook him off. I have no leaders that are not pinned. It's just Mr. You know, Joe Schmo Somali here. He's going to go ahead and cook off this little death pipe at the Little Bird. He better make it because if he doesn't, he's going to be in real trouble. I have a chance to hit. It's considered an anti-tank weapon. A chance to hit an 8 or less on 2d6. Attacking a helicopter at low altitude applies a plus 2 penalty to my roll. Flying at high altitude applies a plus four, but then everybody can see you. And trust me, that douche would have taken a shot. So he definitely made the right choice. Long story short, I have to roll a six or less now on 2d6. All right, here we go. I've got the webcam turned on. Come on, do it. There's a nine. All right, the rocket hisses right past the little bird, uh, hits this little parking lot here, blows up, a, probably flips that truck over. Long story short, it does miss the little bird. So now the little bird gets to release um, his weapons. You'll see he's got two um, attack factors there, a 20 and a 12. So the 20 is his expendable ordnance and the 12 are his machine guns. He has to shoot that all day. The 20, again, are those small you know, rocket pods and stuff like that. So do you want to shoot 20 or 12 or 32? I will take a shot with, you know, I. I I'm just going to take my 20 for now. Oh, no, actually, there's no reason not to yeah, shoot. technically, there is no reason. So I will take a 32. All right, cool. So 32 points into that hex. You do have to add two to the die roll. However, you are on the yellow column. Yellow row, I should say. Little bird for the win. Go for it. I rolled a seven. Seven. Which... Okay. Comes up to nine. Which you can I'm desperate to keep those RPGs. I'm going to pin him down and kill the stupid officer. All right. That's my two casualty points. Which is kind of dumb, because now all he's going to do is... Because now he assaults for free, and he picks up a free prisoner. Because assaulting a pinned down hex is, uh, is basically a free attack. And free victory points. But even if I did the opposite... Well, no, it would have been one point to kill him. Yeah, it would have ended up, end up being the same way. Okay. So, um, yeah, that concludes our aircraft part of the uh, movement phase. We'll see how the rest of this turn wraps up and get back with everyone.